Hello and welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video where I'm going to go through the IGCC Math 0607 Paper 1 from June 2021. So if you are looking to resit, for example, you may want to just need to get that C to move on to your next course, then this is the video for you. I'm going to go through this paper here and I'll show you at the end the uh, grey boundaries for this paper. It's out of 40 marks. And you may be surprised what you need to get a C on this paper. Right, it's 45 minutes, we're going to get started. So question one, we've got to write 25% as a fraction. So we have percent here. Now remember percent, this word here is essentially French for out of a hundred. So this is really important to remember. Percent, percent means out of 100. That's the first thing you need to think of when you see a percentage like this. So we can rewrite this as 25 over 100. This is exactly the same thing as 25%. But at this point, this is not our final answer. We can simplify this particular fraction. So we say to ourselves, oh, let's have a think what number goes into both. Well, we could start with 5 here, for example. I think we know our 5 times table. So if we do 5, we remember to simplify a fraction, we divide top and bottom by 5. And if we do the top, well, 25 divided by 5. So essentially the question we're asking here is 5 times what equals 25? And I think we can see using our times tables, the answer is 5. And then we do the same thing here. So uh, 100 divided by 5. So we're asking ourselves the question, 5 times what equals 100? And hopefully we can see here that the answer will be 20. Yeah, 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 gives us 100. And we're not quite finished, unfortunately, because 5 works again. So we can divide by 5, top and bottom, and we do the same process. So 5 divided by 5, well, that's going to be 1. Again, the question I'm asking is 5 times what is equal to 5? And that's going to be 1. And then using a similar process here, 20 divided by 5, how many 5s does it take to get to 20? Well, that's going to be 4. So our final answer, simplified answer, is going to be 1 over 4. Okay, so notice... In the mark scheme here, you didn't even need to simplify as long as you give a fraction, and that's absolutely fine. But again, you want the most precise answer, then the answer will be a quarter. Now, our next question is we need to write down, <laughs> got a bit overexcited in that question, uh, write down two multiples of 12. So again, as soon as we see the word multiples, these are key words we need to recognize, we need to think times tables. So two numbers that are in the 12 times table. Now, you may know these off by heart. You may have learned them. Or if you're really stuck, you can go 12. And then we can keep adding 12 to give us our multiples. Well, if we do 12 plus 12, well, 2 plus 2 is 4. 1 plus 1 is 2. So our first multiple will be 24. And if we add on 12 again, we can keep doing this trick. If it asks us for five multiples, we could do the same thing. Four plus two is six. Two plus one is three. And we get 36. So those are two possible answers. Again, the mark scheme doesn't mind which numbers we choose. Question three. We need to complete the statement using letters from the diagram. Okay. So line something is a tangent to the circle center zero. So this word tangent to the circle, this means a line that just touches the circle. This is what they're asking for. It just touches the circle. So let's see what line that would be. Well, this touches it twice. This touches it twice. Ah, this one just touches it once here. And so the way we identify this red line that I'm just going to draw over, this so this line here, is we use the letters given here. So we write line EF, FE would also work as well, 
gives us our answer. So first thing, we need to know what a tangent to the circle means, a line that just touches the circle, and then we need to write the correct letters to show the examiner we know which line it is. Okay, question four. Change 1,500 centiliters into liters. Okay, again, I'm going to use the question to help me. So I've got this cent again, and we saw this in question one. Anything cent related is out of 100. And this helps us with our conversion here. Um, 100 centiliters, hence the word centiliters, is equal to one liter. Okay, I'm again using the language to help me. Now, how do I know it's this way round? Well, a centiliter, think, you know, if you go to the supermarket and buy something, that's always going to be a smaller amount than a big liter of Coke or something else. Okay, so this is how we know we're going the right way round. We're going from a smaller unit to a bigger unit, so we're going to divide. This is how I tend to teach it. So putting those two things together, we get our calculation of 1,500 divided, smaller unit to bigger unit, divided by 100, because that's our conversion. And remember, when we were dividing by 100, what we can do in this case is cancel the zeros. Okay, so we're left with the answer of 15. Okay, you can also think of it, okay, as shifting all the digits in one direction. So here we're going to shift all the digits in one direction, one, two, one, two, and this is the one and five comes here. Again, I don't mind how you want to think about that. It gives you the same answer of 15 liters. Check your answers if you have already tried this at home. Okay, question five is a big mass question. So we need to work this out. Now, whenever I see a calculation like this with divides and minuses and multiplying, then I write down bit mass or PEMDAS in the United States to help me do things in the correct order. So we have division, so we have division here, and we have subtraction there. So bit mass tells us that we have to do the division first, and then we do the subtraction afterwards. This is why we write down bit mass. So let's do this in order. So we're going to do the dividing first. So 4 divided by 4 is equal to 1. We keep everything else the same. 10 minus 1. And then that gives us our answer of 9, which we pop over here. Key thing, if you see a mixture of operations, write down bid mass. That will help you think through the process correctly. Question 6. From the list of numbers, write down a cube number okay, and a triangle number. So these are numbers you, you should uh, learn off by heart. Let's start with the cube numbers first of all. So the cube numbers are numbers multiplied by itself three times. So for example, one times one times one is equal to one. Two times two times two, or well, two times two is four, four times two is eight. So these numbers I'm producing here are my cube numbers. If we do 3 times 3 times 3, well, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 3 is 27. So our answer here is this one. So we write in 27. And triangle numbers, again, this is ones that often get neglected uh, by teachers uh, to actually teach here. Um, you can think of this in a few different ways. You can do this as pictures. So you start with 1 and then you draw right angle triangles um, using dots. So you get one, two, three, and then if we do the next one, these are worth learning off by heart. This would be six, and then if we do the next one, I'm not gonna do all of them here, but just to show you the principle of what's going on. Well, this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you may notice the pattern here. This is why it's learning off by heart would make these things easier, is that this goes up by two here, goes up by three here, and six to 10 is plus four. So if I want to get the next number, it'll be uh, 10 plus five, which would be 15, 
and then we have to do plus six. That gives us 21. Oh, we can stop at that point because that's in our list over here. So we write in 21. Again, check your answers. Again, always worth to do. Okay, and on to question seven. So we have a travel graph up on the board. We're showing Subu's bicycle journey from her home to the library and back. And from that diagram, we need to work out some information. So first things first, we need to write down the distance, this is the key word here, from Subu's home to the library. Well, we have this at home, we've got this arrow here, very, very useful. And then we're told where the library is here. Okay, so what we need to do here in order to work out the distance is essentially the distance between the home and the library. Now notice this is in meters, our units here are in meters, so that's very, very good. And so now we just need to look at the scale. So if we look very, very carefully, we'll see that actually between say 100 and 200, we have five steps, yeah? So one, two, three, four, five. Now, because there's a hundred difference here, if we do a hundred divided by five, that will give us 20. So what that tells us is that the small squares go up in 20s. So if we then measure from 300, because we're told that already, then we need to go 300, 320, 340, and then the arrow points at this one here, which is then 360. So the key thing to realize in this question is that these little squares go up in 20s. Now we need to look going the other way. So we're looking for the number of minutes Suba was in the library. Now notice he arrives in the library after 15 minutes. So at this point he is in the library. And then because there is no movement, there's no distance change, he stays in the library until the line goes up or down. So what we're looking for here is the distance between when he enters the library here and then when he exits the library here. So as I said earlier, if I come down here, this is much easier to do on the actual paper itself. You'll see that this is at 15, and then we need to look at this scale carefully. Now, this may, might, might make your eyes go slightly dizzy, but that's, yeah, that's okay. We just need to practice this skill. Hopefully you can see here that the line I'm drawing in is at 30, and then we need to think about the scale here. Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five gap here. So we've got five then divided by five. There's a five gap between 35 and 30. So on the bottom scale here going horizontally, the scale is one. So therefore you can see we need to go 30, 31, 32. So this is 32, this is 15 here. And then to work out the number of minutes, we take one number away from the other. So if we do 32 minus 15, again, you can do that mentally or in a different way, then we get our answer of 17 minutes. Again, I'd always double check the scale, minutes here, minutes here, everything's good. So on to question eight, so we've got test results of 12 lucky students, and we need to find the median, the mode, and the range. Okay, so one thing to be aware of in this question out of two marks. So it won't just be pick out a number, you'll need to do some working. And remember the median means the middle number. So the middle number, but we have to put them in order first. That's really important. So we go from smallest to largest, and then we find the middle number. So in the exam, I would rewrite these numbers out. So I'm gonna find the smallest number, which is six. And as I do this, I'm gonna cross out the numbers. Next smallest is eight. And you may want to fast forward this through this step as I just cross through the numbers. Next smallest is 10. Next smallest is 11. I think we have two 12s. No, we just got one 12 here. So I'm just doing this nice and steadily. We have a 15. That's good. Then we've got a 17. We've got three 21s. Just try and leave yourself a bit more space than I've done here. So we've got one, two, three, 21, that's gonna answer question B, and then 24. Okay, and I'd also check how many numbers you have here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 
I've got 12 students here. That's a good double check that you can do. And the standard way that we find the median is we cross off a number from the bottom, we cross a number from the top, and we keep doing this process, cross, 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 until we get one or two numbers in the middle. So you'll notice here, because there's an even number of students, we actually get two numbers in the middle, 12 and 15. So that's not the answer here. The way we actually find the answer is we take the average, or the mean average of those two numbers. What does that mean? Well, we do 12 plus 15, so we add them together, divided by how many there are. There are two numbers. So if you do this calculation, 12 plus 15 is 27, and 27 divided by two. Again, you can use the bus stop method if you so wish, like this, uh, but you'll get to the answer of 13.5, which is going to be our answer here. Two mark question, they will expect you to do more than just say write down a number. Now the mode here, the mode is the most common number, so I'm gonna write that here. It's good for your own notes as well, if you're making notes for this course. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, notice we had 321s here. That's the most common number by far, so we write in 21. The range, often people forget how to work out the range. This is really uh, important you pay attention. The highest number that we had here was 24. So we put 24, and then we minus the smallest number, which is 6. So 24 minus 6, biggest minus smallest, that's equal to 18. And this is one of the useful reasons why to put these in order, so you can simply read off the range nice and easily, which is going to be 18, right? So you can have a check of the answers, and you can see where you pick up the method mark for question 8a. All good. Right, on we go. So question 9, we're going to look for a set here. But don't let the language confuse you. So P, our set, are prime numbers less than 10. And we need to write down the members of set P. So basically what we need to do is write down the numbers that fit this criterion. So we need to write down all prime numbers less than 10. Well, let's have a think. Is one prime? Let you think about that for a few seconds. Okay, one is not prime. This is a really important thing to remember because it only has one factor, not two. Two is prime because there are only two numbers that go into two. That's one and two. Is three prime? Yes, it is, because only two numbers go into three. One and three. Is four prime? No, it isn't, because two times two is four. Okay, so four is not prime. And we just work our way along until we have all numbers. Five only has two factors, one and five. Six is three times two, that doesn't work. Seven is prime, because only one and seven go into it. Eight is not prime, because four times two is eight. Nine is also not prime, because three times three is nine. So you have to just work your way through those particular numbers. Now, strictly speaking, you should put the set notation, but you won't get a mark lost if you do not put these curly brackets. Right, on to question 10. So work out 60% of 35. So there are a couple of ways we can do this. The way I would recommend doing this is work out 10%. This should be your sort of standard approach to any of these kind of questions. So if a whole one is 35, 100%, to work out 10%, we take our original number and divide it by 10. Now, the reason we start with 10% is this makes our life a lot easier. If you divide by 10, remember, you have 35. And if we've got a decimal point there, again, you can think of this in different ways, but the decimal point will come to here, and we get 3.5. This is why we find out 10%, because it's an easy number to work out. This is a little trickier now, because we don't want 10% for our question. We want 60%, so then we think to ourselves, what do we do to 10 to get to 60? Well, we're going to multiply by 6, and whatever we do to one side, we do to the other. So then we need to calculate 3.5 times 6. Well, we can just use our normal multiplication methods to do this. So 6 times 5 is 30, 0 carried 3, 
make sure the decimal is in the right place. 6 times 3 is 18. 18 plus 3 is 21. So we write in 21. And that is going to be our answer. 21. Now you could have found 20% in times by 3. That also works. Or you could possibly also find 50% and 10% and add those together. Notice all these roots are getting to the same answer of 21. Question 11, we need to simplify this. Now one thing to be aware of is if it was plus, w plus w plus w, this would be equal to 3w. This is important to remember as well. But because we're multiplying w times w times w, how many w's will we have? Well, we have three but we have to write w cubed with a small 3 up here. So this is a really important rule to remember, generally speaking. So if you're adding w's, you put a big 3 in front of the w. If you're multiplying w's together, you put a small 3 on the top right-hand side, like so. Again, one of these things, if you know it, you'll get the mark. If you don't, you're going to lose that mark, and it could be the difference between a grade. Question 12. What type of correlation is shown on the scatter diagram? So what we want to try and do here is draw a line the best fit that makes sense. Now if we try and draw a line like this, does this really represent the data? Not really, so that doesn't quite work. If I do the line the other way around, like this, does that really represent the data? Not really either, so if you can't do either of those, it has zero correlation. So they're looking for the word here, zero. Um, I would consider this also no correlation. Zero is the word to write. So whenever you see this word correlation, can you draw a line of best fit that makes sense? If not, then it's zero correlation. Okay, so you can check the answers that I've just uh, gone through and make sure you're happy with where you pick up your method marks. If you're liking the content, then do consider liking and subscribing, particularly if you're looking for more core content from either the 067 course or the 0580 course. Okay, on we go, question 13, 14, getting a bit trickier. So for this one, this is, uh, yeah, getting towards the C grade content on the exam paper. Describe fully the single transformation that maps shape P onto shape Q. Notice it is out of three marks. So we need to be quite careful about how we do this. So first of all, we notice that P is much smaller than Q. So we're having what's called an enlargement because P, uh, Q is bigger than P. So one mark for enlargement, recognizing that we're not translating or reflecting or rotating, but we're enlarging it. And when we talk about enlargements, we need two extra bits of information. So we need a scale factor so how big has it got? And the way we check that is by taking corresponding parts of the shape. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, notice here, the length of this is one. Notice the bottom here, however, has a length of three. So to work out the scale factor, we do three, the big side, divided by one, and that's just equal to three. So our scale factor is going to be equal to three. So that's our second mark. And at this point, we need to work out where it's being enlarged from. Okay, so what point is it um, essentially being enlarged from? Now, the way we do this is by drawing in some lovely rays, which I'm going to do in a different color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect up corresponding points. So notice this is the same point on both shapes. And I'm going to draw a diagonal line that connects them up and just continue forward. Okay, you could also go in the other direction as well. Let's take a, another corresponding point. We'll do some magenta, let's take this one down here and we do the same thing. So in order to go from here to here, we're gonna go one down and two along, one down, two along, one down and two along. And you'll notice as I draw in these rays, I'm gonna do these in different colors. Let's do this in green. Uh, we're now going to do the point up here, which works in the same way. So we just join all these up and carry on until you notice that all three of these rays go through a single point. They all go through this point here. And this point is the origin, or it's zero, uh, zero. 
So that's going to be our center of enlargement. So I'm going to use COE for center of enlargement, and then our point is 0, 0. So what we do is we draw these rays in with corresponding points. I've done in lots of pretty colors, and you'll notice that they all go through 0, 0. This is the mark that students often forget on core. So often get enlargement, they often get scale factor 3, but you need to have the center of enlargement for all three marks. Okay, and now we need to shade the region indicated with each Venn diagram. So if we take this symbol here, this means the union, so U for union. And another way of thinking about this is A or B. Okay, so this union I'm going to think of as OR, which will help you shade in the right parts of the Venn diagram. So we're shading anything that is A or B. So is this in A? Well, yes, it's in A. And is this in B? Yeah, well, this is in B. And if we take the middle part, is that in A or B? Well, it's in both, actually. So we can shade that part in as well. Well, the only parts of the IGCC paper one where you get to do a bit of colouring. Uh, the next part, however, this is slightly different. So this is C uh, intersections, this word we use intersection here. And we think of this of C and D, i.e. the overlap between both of them. Now, which part of the Venn diagram represents the overlap? Well, that's the part in the middle. So we just shade that part in like so. Okay, show you the mark scheme. Notice one mark for each, exactly as I said. So enlargement, scale factor three. Um, you don't even have to write center of enlargement, just indicate that point zero, zero, and the shading in underneath. Okay, and on to question 15. So we've got a graph of a function with one, and this is a very strange word here, asymptote, that's how we say that word. And on the diagram, we need to draw an asymptote. Now, what is an asymptote? It's a line where the graph goes towards, but never reaches. Okay, I'll explain that in more detail. So it goes towards, but never reaches. In German, you call this an Ernährungslinie, so literally a nearing line, yeah, but never reaches. Now, what do I actually mean by this? That seems like complete alien, alien language. Well, if I draw a vert uh, horizontal, horizontal line at 2, notice if I do this correctly, and I'll try and keep this as straight as possible, hopefully you can agree that as this line goes down, 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 it's getting very close to this red line I've just drawn in, but it never actually reaches it, even if we go on forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, so that's what I mean here by an asymptote. This is the red line I've just drawn in, where the function, where the line, it's very, 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 very close, but never actually reaches that red line. So that's what the question is looking for here. Now, we've got question 16 here, solve the inequality. So if I write this over here, again, the key thing with any inequality, and when I say inequality, I mean this weird symbol here, less than or equal to, and we treat it like an equation. So if I was to treat this like an equation, 2x equals 10, then what I would do is divide by 2 on both sides. Okay, what's the opposite of timesing by 2? Dividing by 2, but we have to do the same to both sides. These cancel, we're left with just x here, less than or equal to, and then 10 divided by 2 is equal to 5. And that is our answer. They're not looking for anything more than that. Okay, so particularly on core, if you see an inequality like this, treat it like an equality, treat it like a normal equation. Question 17, find the highest common factor of 70 and 80. So there are a couple of ways uh, you can do this. Um, the way I would go about doing this is writing out all the factors and then seeing what's in common. So if we start with 70, for example, and write down all the factors, well, one and 70 obviously go into both numbers. Uh, if we divide by two, so two goes into it, 35 goes into it. Uh, 3 doesn't go into 70 because uh, 7 plus 0 is 7. 3 doesn't go into 7. Uh, 4 doesn't go into 70 either. Again, you can check this by the bus stop method. 5 does go into 70. And if you're thinking, ah, how many times does 5 go into 70? A quick bus stop is very use useful here. So 5s into 7 go 1, remainder 2. 5s into 20 go 14. 
So five goes in, uh, 14 goes in, hopefully I've got enough room here. And of course, we've also got a 10 times table as well. So we've also got 10 and seven going in. And notice that we could check six, six doesn't, if you know your six times table. And because seven and 10, um, there's no number beyond 10 that also goes into it because we're checking from the other side. So we know we've got all the factors. Now, you probably can see some of you that 10 is going to be our highest common factor, but we do the same process with 80 as well. So we start with 1 and 80. Notice I'm going in pairs here, 2 and 40. Uh, 3 doesn't work for the same reason. 4 does go in now, so 4 and 20. Uh, 5 does go in as well, so that's going to be 5 and... Again, we can just do bus stop, I think it's 16. Again, we can double check one, uh, remainder three. Yeah, that's going to be 16. And of course, don't forget 10 as well. So you've got eight and 10. And notice that the highest number they share is that 10 that we talked about earlier. So the most practical way of doing this, if you can spot it, fantastic. Write down the answer, one mark. If you can't spot it, write down all the factors you can and find the highest number they share, which in this case is going to be 10. Okay, and question 18. So a train travels 250 meters in five seconds, and we want to work out the average speed in kilometers per hour. So notice the units are very different here. And what we're going to do is convert into meters per second, because it's speed, and then we're gonna convert that to kilometers per hour. Now, don't forget your speed, distance, time formula triangle that looks like this. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the speed. So we cover that up. So the way to work out speed is we do distance divided by time. So to work out the speed, we're going to take our distance, which is 250. And then we're going to divide that by five. And that's going to be equal to 50 meters per second. But that is not what the question wants. It wants that speed in kilometers per hour, which is a much more natural way of measuring speed. So I'm gonna write that up here, 50 meters per second. And we're gonna do this in stages so we can get two kilometers per hour. So let's focus on the time first of all. So if we're going 50 meters per second, how do we work out then meters per minute? Well, there are 60 seconds in a minute, so we're going to times both sides by 60. Because if you can run or travel 50 meters per second, then that means you can travel 60 times 50 meters per minute. Well, 60 times 50, or well, 6 times 5 is 30, and then we add on the zeros. So that's going to be 3,000 meters per minute. And then we go, well, we don't want meters per minute. We want to carry on, so we want meters per hour. How many minutes in an hour? Same calculation, we're gonna times by 60, 60 minutes in an hour. And then we do a similar thing. So 3000 times 60, six times three is 18. And then we've got one, two, three, four zeros. So we're gonna have 180,000 meters per hour. However, we don't want meters per hour, we want kilometers per hour instead. So we're going from a smaller unit to a bigger unit. So we know a thousand meters is equal to a kilometer. So notice here, instead of timesing like we've done before, we are dividing by a thousand. Here we went from a small unit to a big unit on the right hand side of our fraction. Here, we want to go from smaller to bigger but on the left hand side. So we are going to divide by a thousand. And if we do that, we can actually remove three of those zeros, like so, and then we get our answer of 180, which I'm gonna write down here. Make sure if you're not sure about this particular question, just make sure you go through it very steadily like I've done just here. So please check your answers, uh, what we've done, questions 15 to 18. We've only got another couple of slides to go, so keep with it, and I'm sure we'll get through it and make sure we understand what's going on on this paper one. Right, so on to question 19. We want to simplify this fraction. So remember, with any multiplying by fractions, it's all straightforward. We just multiply the tops, so 12 times five is equal to 60, and we multiply the bottoms. So 
x times 2y, we just put it all together, 2xy. That gives us our one mark, but we want to get all two marks. So the way we do that is we can actually simplify the number part. So how many twos go into two? That's going to be one. How many twos go into 60? That's going to be 30, just half of it. And that gives us our final answer of 30 over xy. Make sure you're getting all two marks on this. It's very tempting to stay at this point, but we need to try and get every single mark that we can. Question 20, we have a function, okay, x minus 3 over 2, and we're given the domain, so this is the word to be familiar with, so the domain, so the values that x can be, and we want to find out the range. Well, notice the range essentially is the outputs, okay, so these are the inputs, and these we want to find the outputs. So we take each of these values, minus 5 and 21, and we put it into our function. Okay, so those are our inputs, minus 5 and 21, and that will then tell us our range. So f of minus 5, we replace the x here with minus 5. If we do that, so all I've done here is copy this out, replace the x with minus 5. Now we've got a bit of negative number work to do. So minus 5 minus 3 is equal to minus 8 divided by 2. And minus 8 divided by 2 is equal to minus 4. Okay, and now we do exactly the same thing with the number 21. So if we do this, I'm going to replace the x here with 21. So we get 21 minus 3 over 2. Slightly easier to calculate. So 21 minus 3 is 18. 18 divided by 2 is equal to 9. Now, how do we actually write our answer? This is the important thing to get the notation correct. Well, we're going to put our minus 4 at the start, our 9 at the end. And notice we have to put these inequality symbols just like in the domain. But instead of x, we're looking for the range of f of x. So we put f of x in here as well. You could put y as well, because y's are outputs, x are inputs. OK, but to get all full two marks, make sure you're using the correct notation. Question 21, we've got two rectangles here that are similar. Now remember this has a very mathematical meaning, so they're in the same proportion, okay, which is an important thing to realize here. And now we just need to find what the scale factor is. Well, let's take corresponding sides. Again, what do I mean by this? Well, notice the small rectangle has a length of 10 here. Whereas if I take the big rectangle, we notice that is equal to 10 plus 5, which is 15 centimetres. So to work out the scale factor between the small rectangle and the big rectangle, we do big number, 15, divided by a smaller number, which is 10, and that's going to be equal to 1.5. So the length proportions between the small and the bigger the scale factor is going to be 1.5. Now, how do we use that? Well, we want to work out EF. So we don't know what this is at the moment. We know the smaller one is equal to 12. So we can now use our scale factor at this point. We take our 12, so that's our bottom length. We multiply by our scale factor, 1.5, and that will give us the biggest length. Now, how do we actually work this out, 12 times 1.5? You may see the answer already but we can also think of this as a fraction. So 1.5 is the same as 3 over 2. If we multiply our fractions, notice this is the same as saying 12 over 1, so we get 36, 12 times 3 is 36, 1 times 2 is 2, and 36 divided by 2 is equal to 80. Always make sure that your answer makes sense at the end. So is 18 bigger than 12? Well, it is. Is it 1.5 in terms of scale factor? Yes, it is. We have our correct answer. Again, check your working nice and carefully. Interesting on question 20. Um, whether they would accept why, it's not very clear from the mark scheme, but I certainly would um, if I was actually marking this as well. Right, on we go. So we've got question 22 and 23. So A is the point minus 3, 1. 
b is the point 1, 3, work out the gradient, the keyword, of the line AB. And so I'm underlining keywords as I go along. Remember, the gradient is the same as the slope. So it's the slope of this particular line segment, AB. And we can just use the formula. So the gradient formula, I recommend do learning this off by heart. Very useful if you do IB or A level later on, is it's the differences in the Ys. So Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, the differences between the Xs. Now, I tend to label the coordinates so I know which one is which. So this is going to be my x1, this is going to be my y1, this is going to be my x2, that's going to be my y2. And I just substitute in the coordinates. So let's just be very careful. So y2 is equal to 3, y1 is equal to 1, so 3 minus 1, divided by x2, that's 1. This is where we have to be very careful. So our x1 is minus 3, so we get minus minus 3, two minuses. So if we work this out, 3 minus 1 is equal to 2, 1 minus minus 3, 2 minuses make a plus, we're next to each other, 1 plus 3 is 4, and we can simplify this fraction at this point because 2 quarters is the same as 1 half. So make sure you know that formula, that will make your life a lot easier. Question 23, so the diagram shows a sector of a circle centre 0, radius 6 centimetres, find the area of the sector and leave your answer in terms of pi. Again, these kind of questions are quite rare on paper ones because usually you can use a calculator for this. Now, the formula for the area of a sector is linked to the area of a circle. So the area of a sector is the angle, so I'm going to use this theta, weird symbol for angle, divided by 360, multiplied by a formula you should know very well, the area of a circle, and that is equal to pi r squared. That is our formula. So what we need to do is put in the details that we have. Now our angle is equal to 120 degrees. The radius of the circle, notice this is the radius here, down the bottom, is equal to 6 centimetres. At this point, we put it into our formula, and hopefully we can sort out any of the algebra. So we get 120 divided by 360, multiplied, so I'll put the multiply in, pi times radius squared. So that's 6 squared. Right, let's think if we can simplify this at all. Well, notice we've got 120 over 360, so we can cancel the zeros, because you've got the same top and bottom. 12 divided by 36, well, how many 12s go into 12? Well, that's 1. How many 12s go into 36? Well, 12, 24, 36. That's going to be equal to 3. So actually, this is one third of a circle, which makes a lot of sense. We have the pi, so don't forget the pi is still there. And then we get 6 squared. Well, 6 squared is the same as 6 times 6, which is 36. And then we look at this and go, oh, we can do some more simplifying. So 3 goes into this. That's helpful. So how many 3s go into 3? Well, that's 1. How many 3s go into 36? We kind of did this already, didn't we? So that's going to be 12. Yeah, so something uh, plus something plus something is 36, where the somethings are the same. Well, that's going to be 12. Okay, you can always do, of course, your bus stop method if you're not sure. So 3s and 36 go 1, 3s and 6 go 2. And if we simplify all this down, we're, all we're left with, well, 1 doesn't make any difference, uh, pi and 12. So this just becomes pi times 12, which we tend to write in good mathematical notation, 12 pi centimetres squared. Check your answers here. You can see they use a decimal rather than one half, but that's absolutely fine. Notice I'm picking up all my method marks here by showing this working here, and likewise showing this working here as well. Right, probably what you've been waiting for right at the end. How many marks out of 40 do you need to get a C? Well, let me show you. So this comes directly from the IGCC Cambridge board here. So surprisingly, you only need, on this particular paper, 22 marks out of 40 to get a C. So if I do 22 out of 40, that's the same as 11 
out of 20, so that's equal to 55%. Don't worry, don't have to do it as quickly as that in terms of working out the percentage, but that gives you just a good ballpark figure of how many marks you need. You need 55% on this paper to get your C. And I think that is very doable for many of you out there. Right, hope you enjoyed this video. Again, please do click the like button and subscribe if you want more of this content. And I'll see you on the next walkthrough video. All right, bye-bye for now.